Hi, and welcome to Film Forums. I'm Richard Williams, creator of this platform, a place dedicated to the filmmaking community. We interview members of the film industry to find out what it really takes to make a movie, bring a script to screen, or secure their acting role. If that sounds good to you, please subscribe to us on YouTube and follow us on your favourite podcasting platform so you can be the first to know when an episode drops. Thank you. I would hope that they would look at me as being just as innocent as they are. I mean, I'm the same as them, except that I was arrested for something that I didn't do, and they were not. They got a psychological profile from the NYPD, and I happened to fit that psychological profile. The police spoke to a lot of students in the, in the high school and some of them told the police they might want to talk to me because I was quiet and to myself and I didn't really fit in there. I was charged with uh, murder and rape. Yo, man, you, you cost me 16 years of my life. Welcome to Film Forums. I've got uh, Gia Verts with me. He's a, a filmmaker. Um, can you briefly introduce yourself, please? Sure. Yeah. And thanks for having me, Richard. <laughs> um, my name is Gia, as you said. I'm a documentary filmmaker and I focus on films about true crime and specifically wrongful convictions. Before going into filmmaking last year, I had a 20 year career in the fashion industry on the business side of things. And I left that career with a goal in mind to make films about wrongful convictions so that I could uh, shed light on the cause and hopefully help amplify voices of people who've been wrongfully convicted and who might be stuck in the justice system who could use the, the help and the uh, awareness. You're a contributor for one of the biggest names in publishing, Forbes, uh, and the owner of a fashion brand, as you just alluded to, as well as being a filmmaker. How did you arrive at that point? Can you kind of elaborate on how you've managed to, to get to that? Yeah, for sure. Um, I started working in retail when I was like 17, 18 years old, really young. And I moved up very quickly onto the corporate side of the fashion world, into the corporate offices. And I did that for a really long time. I did that for 15 years. And then for the last five years of that career, I started my own fashion company called Studio 15. Um, and I did that because I wanted to, one, work for myself, and two, I wanted to also give back and help other women. So I partnered with a nonprofit organization. And we donated 5% of our sales to help female entrepreneurs in Uganda. We worked with Cleos, it's a nonprofit organization, and they would give the microfinance loans to these women to help them start their own businesses. And so I did that for 20 years. And I mean, the whole working in the fashion industry for 20 years overall. And as a result, one time Forbes did an article about Studio 15 and about the nonprofit that we worked with. And that's how I ended up meeting the Forbes editors. And then when we spoke and, you know, built a relationship and talked about what we do at my company, they ended up offering me a Forbes column just because I had a lot of experience, not only in the brick and mortar side of the industry, but also in e-commerce. And so that's what I write about in, uh, in Forbes. So done that for a few years now. Wow, awesome. That must give you such a kick still writing for such a big publication. Um... I really enjoy it. It's nice to have. It's funny now because I switched to filmmaking last year, but I still write about e-commerce growth. So it's kind of I'm in this transition period where I'm debating what I should you know, do going forward because that's kind of my old career now. Um, but I do. I really, really enjoy it. It's, yeah. it's really nice to have that outlet. And also in this day and age to be able to work from home and you know have a side gig where I can write. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Do you see yourself um, venturing into writing about filmmaking, um, that kind of area? Uh, do you think there's scope the for goal. that? Yes, yes. So I'm going to talk to them about that. It's on my long to-do list to talk to them about that later. But ideally, yes, so that everything is kind of aligned, you know. <laughs> yeah, well, that would make sense for your career and benefit them as well. So yeah, why not? Um, after you reached out to me on social media, we briefly discussed our mutual interest in criminal injustice. Um, can you tell us why you've taken such an interest in the subject and then talk a bit more about your short documentary conviction, um, what it's about, etc.? 
Yeah, absolutely. So I um, went, I had no background in any advocacy work or anything like that around criminal justice. Um, much like you, I'm just a real big fan of true crime documentaries and true crime stories. Um, but when I was like 20 years old, I read this book by Reuben Carter. It's called The 16th Round. And it it was my favorite book then. And, you know, 20 years later, it's still my absolute favorite book. It was such a heart-wrenching read because uh, for anyone who's not familiar with Reuben Carter, he was a famous boxer in the 60s and he was African-American and he was wrongfully convicted of a murder that he didn't commit. And what really stuck out to me were two things about that book and they really just left a mark. One was that he was a celebrity back then and even, even he was able to be wrongfully convicted of a murder. And I mean, if you think about that today, if there was some famous celebrity that got wrongfully convicted of a murder, I feel like they would have every resource, all the money to not allow that to happen. And the fact that it could have happened to him back then or that it did happen to him was so alarming to me. And the other thing was that he wrote this book when he was in prison, he had a life sentence and he had exhausted all of his appeals. So he had no real options, no avenues to getting out. And he wrote this as this last plea to like, humankind you know will anybody listen to me will anybody help me and because he wrote it so honestly and from that place it was it was like a gut-wrenching book to read and I remember being 20 and just thinking how can this happen like how can this happen to somebody and if I remember correctly I, and I haven't read this book in 20 years but the last page or the last few pages of the book said something like you know I don't have any hatred towards people that put me in here because their hate is what put me in here. And I know that hate won't get me out. And I just, that was just so profound to me. Cause I was like, if I was in his, his position, I would have, um, I think I would have so much hate and anger inside and he didn't. And I found that fascinating. And that was my introduction to, you know, criminal injustice and wrongful convictions. And that really hooked me because I can't imagine not only the physical hell of living in a prison, but just the mental hell of everybody you know and law enforcement and you know the general public believing you did something so horrific and thinking that you are a monster when you're absolutely not that person. And so just it just really stuck with me. And then I always had a passion for it, but I didn't really know what to do. Like most people, when you're passionate about a cause, you can volunteer or you can like, you know, donate some money. But other than that, I wasn't sure what I could do. And then fast forward to like 2014, I was at home one day and my husband came home from work and he was like, you got to hear this podcast. And this is before podcasts were even a thing. Like they weren't popular at all. And I'm a real visual person. And so I said, no, nah, I don't want to hear it. And he said, no, no, you have to hear it. It's a true crime story. And you like those. And I was like a little bit intrigued. And I still said no. And he said, well, it's about a Pakistani family. And my family is also Pakistani. And so that really got me interested. And I said, okay, let's hear one episode. So we were eating dinner. He played the first episode and I was like, oh my God, play the second one and the third one. And he played four episodes and I said, play the next one. And he was like, there's no more. Like it comes out every Thursday and this is all that's been released. <laughs> and I was completely hooked like everybody else. And it was a serial podcast. Um, and so if you've heard that it's a non-science story and he's wrongfully convicted of a murder that he didn't commit. And to me, when I listened to it, it was like, he is, Adnan is the same age as my brother. I have two brothers and Adnan's like smack dab. They're one year apart and they're all like all in the same age group. And while I listened to Adnan's story, I was like, all of the things they said about him that made the cops, you know, think that he was guilty was like, you know, he he was living a double life because he wouldn't tell his parents he was going out drinking and things like this, you know, stuff like that. And I was like, what are you talking about? We've all done that. Like then are we all murderers? I mean, that's an insane way to think. And especially coming from a, a East Indian background, your, our parents are very, they come to this country and they're very strict and uh, they're not, they don't drink and they don't do any of those things. And so they definitely, don't let you do them. And so if you're going to do them just to kind of fit into North American culture and whatnot, you hide it from your parents. And so it, it was just very alarming to me what happened to Adnan. And I really felt for him because of what I'd read in Reuben Carter's book. And because I have brothers that reminded me so much of Adnan. And so I decided I wanted to do something to help him. And I organized a fundraiser out here in New York. And that was my first introduction to, you know, doing any kind of 
work to help people who've been wrongfully convicted. The documentary, which is on Amazon Prime right now, is about 20 minutes long, um, which I was severely disappointed at uh, when I was watching it. I watched it before and I watched it just before this interview again, so for the second time, and I thought it was just as amazing. And it left me wanting more. And I've since discovered that I believe you're, you're making a feature length version of it. Yes, thank you so much. I can't believe you watched it again. <laughs> um, I am. So I am in post production on the feature length film. And actually, it's almost finished because once quarantine started, we couldn't do anything. And so I spent my time editing the film, uh, which was kind of nice. But we have two shoots left. And because of COVID, we weren't able to do those. Um, one of them is in a prison and they're not letting anybody in. Uh, so I'm kind of just waiting to see how that goes. But I am excited to to finish the feature length version. I also felt like when I was making the short, there were so many things that I wanted to include. But you know, as you probably know, when you're making a short film, it's gotta be really focused on like one aspect of the story. Otherwise viewers, you know, will get too little information about too many aspects. And Jeff's story, as you know, is so complex because he went through so, so much. I mean, he went into prison at, at 17 years old. Um, and he was a high school student. He get, got pulled out of high school and didn't get to graduate and all of these things. There's so much to talk about. And, um, and so I really, really wanted to make the feature. And so once I finished the short, I just continued filming and, and we're almost done. I'm hoping to release mid 2021. Um, that might be too ambitious, but but I'm hoping so. <laughs> I hope it comes out as soon as possible. It's as simple as that. It's so, uh, so great. Um, please look out for it, everyone. Um, you know, when, uh, when it finally hits, it'll be well, well worth a watch. And if you can't wait till then, at least watch the, uh, the 20 minute short version um, to get a taste of uh, and what's to come. As your debut film, what do you think you did particularly well? And what, if anything, do you think you could improve on next time? You know, I made this film with a really small team. There was just four of us. And so it was a lot of work and everybody wore a lot of hats. I think what we could definitely improve on in the future and when we have more budget and things like that is to work with a bigger team. I think if I had a bigger editing team, we could have more creative minds you know, in there and we, that would make for a better end product and a better film. So that's what I'm hoping to do in the future is hire some editors so that we can work together and bounce ideas off of each other. Um, what I did well, I think. Uh, the one thing that comes really naturally to me is interviewing people. And for some reason, ever since I was young, I've had people I meet for the very first time and shockingly, they'll tell me secrets or tell me things that are a little bit that you wouldn't just tell anybody, especially a stranger. Um, I've always noticed that about myself, that people will just kind of open up. And so that lends itself really, really well to doing interviews for documentaries because people get really candid and they feel comfortable and they really open up. And so as Jeff did, and that really made for a you know, great dialogue and a great film, I always joke around that Jeff is like a filmmaker's dream though, because he's very, very uh, open about everything. And he can almost, not even almost, he really can talk about things that most people would feel uncomfortable saying, but he can talk about it very matter of factly. And I found that to be very interesting. So I yeah, think- Yeah, I was gonna, well. gonna ask you like, were you surprised at how sort of measured and, and relatively calm um, Jeffrey was? Um, it seemed to me he provided a really clear and balanced reflection of his experiences inside. Whereas I think I would have just crumbled after six months, frankly, uh, after what he went through. So yeah. Yes, I was, I was very, very surprised at that. Um, it's funny because I asked Jeff a similar question. I asked him in one of my interviews, I said, how do you stay so even keel, like talking about all this stuff, you know? And um, I was very surprised, pleasantly surprised. It was really nice. Um, what Jeff did say to me in one of the interviews is that he stays so even keeled because he almost compartmentalizes it. It's almost like he says he feels like it almost didn't happen to him, like he's talking about somebody else. And he does that as a coping mechanism. And I think that's why one of the reasons why. The other thing, which is just my own observation, but I think the reason he can be that way is because Jeff has just had a remarkable life story, as you probably, I won't spoil the end of the film, but as you know, and so he's done a lot of advocacy work ever since he got out of prison, which I think was 12 to 14 years ago, some, somewhere around that. And so he's told his story so many times that I feel like maybe that's been therapeutic for him and he's gotten more and more comfortable with it over time, but he's very, very singular focused about helping other people, about using his story to help other people who've been wrongfully convicted. So um, I, think, I think that's also why he can be that way. But I will share with you that behind the scenes, Jeff made really, 
he made really funny jokes about about his time and his experience, his time in prison and his experience. And the first time he did that, I was very quiet. And I was like, did I hear that right? Because you don't want to laugh in these situations because it's so horrific, you know, but Jeff has a dark sense of humor and he can laugh about it now, which is so awesome. I'm so happy that he's at that place, you know, yeah. but from a filmmaker's perspective and somebody who didn't know Jeff really well, when I started this, I was like, wait a minute, did he just say that? <laughs> well, that's amazing. That's just an amazing reflection of how he's managed to uh, mentally um, process what's happened to him, uh, cope with it and come out uh, a better person and not, as he alludes to in the documentary, not let it um, affect his life any more than it, than it had to. So yeah, it's such a reflection on him as a person, isn't it? It really is. It really is. He, Jeff is such a, such a great giving person for sure. And it's really tough to see too, because to, to just watch him and he'll, he'll tell you himself, he has a lot of after effects of growing up in prison, like loud noises really shake him up. Like he, if, if, if the phone rings really loud or if there's like a loud car, because he said in prison, um, and I think I have this in the feature length film, but not in the short, but he said that in prison, you know, you're always listening, but you can't see because you're, you can't see the rest of the space because you're locked up in one cell. And he said loud noises are kind of like your indication of when something is wrong, whether there's violence or the keys, like the guards keys shaking, like those are all signs of like danger almost. And so for 16 years, that was his indication for something is wrong. And I guess now he's out in the real world, but that's just in his mind. And so he has these after effects. So he's he's a really giving, wonderful person. And then he has these after effects he has to deal with all the time. It's it's a real like juxtaposition. And it's it's very interesting to see from the outside looking in. And it's also very, very um sad mm. at times. It'd be impossible for anyone to go through that and, and deal with it as well as he has without having some sort of um, effect on you mentally long term. It, it's absolutely impossible. You wouldn't be human otherwise. So um, for sure. yeah, it's unsettling and sad to hear, but not surprising, um, unfortunately. Um, yes. What's the main takeaway you'd like people to um, get from um, the film? You know, um, the biggest thing for me, it's funny because my goal has changed a little bit. I would have told you even a couple of weeks ago that uh, if I could just, if the film could just raise a little bit of awareness that would make other people realize that this is a serious issue that would i think go a long way in making change in the future but uh because i think most people believe in the justice system and most people trust law enforcement and if someone gets convicted of something majority of people automatically think oh they did it they must have done something wrong or they must have committed this crime most people don't think that there's some prosecutors and some police officers who are just committing crimes themselves you know by falsely accusing people of things they didn't do and so if i could just raise awareness towards that that i think that would be great. Um, now, in the past month, we've been invited to three different schools to um, screen the film and do Q&As with the criminal justice students and law students. And so that's been amazing. That's I was that's like more than I could have even hoped for. So my goal has changed a little bit. I would love to do more of that and and hopefully impact these people who will be future lawyers or future jurors and, and things like that. Uh, so I hope down the line with the feature and future films, we can make a bigger, bigger impact. Mm. And I understand, am I right in saying you've, you've won one or two awards um, in the last few weeks? Is that right? <laughs> That's right. In the last uh, three weeks, we won three awards. We won um, Best Picture and Best Cinematography at the Georgia Shorts and Georgia Documentary Festivals. And then we won an award of distinction at the Canada Shorts Film Festival. Oh, congratulations. Fantastic. You're getting, you know, the... Um, the recognition um, and further exposure that, that I feel that you deserve um, for, for this. It's that's fantastic. Um, Thank you. Do you think that you'll continue with documentary filmmaking or do you think you might explore narrative filmmaking at some point in the future? You know, I don't think I'll do narrative. I mean, I never know what the future holds, but I left my career and my salary, you know, with the clear intention of working on something that helps this cause. And in, I'm, you know, I'm in my forties now. And that's when I realized that like how I spend every day, like my day to day is what is most meaningful to me. And so I don't have a desire to do that because I don't think it's going to lead to my personal, you know, end goal. So I don't think so, but who knows down, down the line.
finally, what's the best advice you've been given as a filmmaker that you could pass on to other budding filmmakers? I guess it would be documentary filmmakers. I got some great advice from our professors when I went to New York Film Academy. They said that it's funny because you're shooting movies and so you would think that your video quality is the most important thing. I asked a professor, you know, what camera should I buy? Because I was looking to invest in a better camera once I finished school. And she said, it doesn't matter. She's like, if you have to shoot it with your iPhone, it doesn't even really matter. She said, what matters is the story and how you craft it and how compelling it is. And if your story is so compelling that people forget to even think about what camera you used or what quality of the video is, then you have a really great film. And the second thing they said was that audio is the most important thing and not the video because viewers, when they're watching your film, if they if there's bad audio, they'll turn off the movie. They can't hear, they get frustrated. But if the audio is crystal clear and great, you can always shoot B-roll or what have you to go with that audio. But they said audio is really the key when you're filmmaking. And that was shocking to me because, you know, from with a photography background myself and loving being behind the camera and also just having a belief just naively that video was the most important thing. That was a big learning moment for me. A lot of work goes into getting the sound perfect, not just equipment, but uh, post-production as well. So um, no, I think that's a really good point and, and something that maybe not all filmmakers, even um, aspiring filmmakers might not think about initially as you didn't. So um, yeah, that's really good advice, I think. Um, yes. Brilliant. Okay, well, thank you so, so much for your time today. I'm so, so pleased to have a, the opportunity to speak with you about this. And uh, again, I implore people to to watch uh, Conviction on Prime now, if they can. Uh, it's 20 minutes long as a teaser, really, a long teaser, um, and then catch it in 2021 when the feature um, comes out eventually. Thank you so much, Richard. Thanks for having me. <laughs>